So, uh, forgot the suit, but anyway. You know, I always think about that when, you know, the doctor, Charles Stanley, comes on. He come, used to, now that he sits up there, he sits. But used to, he would come rushing up to the pulpit or on the screen when he would video and start talking. But, hey, that's for the professionals. But glad that everyone is here tonight. Certainly glad for those following along as we are coming down the home stretch. We only have a couple lessons left in the study of the Song of Solomon. And tonight, we will actually have her name pronounced. He will actually pronounce her name tonight. He will. You just rest in your hand? Okay. Uh, I thought you had your hand raised. <laughs> um, as we were in lesson 10, the romantic husband question mark. We have been following along with the Song of Solomon, which we know was really the, so the song of all songs that Solomon wrote over a thousand songs in addition to the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and all the things that we studied. But this was his love relationship with, we said that dark-headed, dark, curly-haired dark, curly girl that was from the northern part of Israel and Galilee and that he fell in love with. And we've spent several chapters of them in their courtship, in their dating. We followed them along as they were married. We even went into the bedroom with them as they were uh, on their honeymoon. And then we had the day after when we had a little fight and then... Um, she, uh, they tried to make up a little bit last week, and today we'll pick up with that. Because the last thing we remember, she was going out to look for him. He had come home late at night and knocked on the door, and she said, Hey, my feet are clean, my robe's up, I ain't getting up and coming to the door. Well, he left after a few knocks, and she finally wished she'd gone, and when she got there, she was gone. And then she went out after him. And then, depending on which perspective you look at, she was either physically beat up, by the people who were helping her look for her husband, or she was in her mind uh, beat down because she was so upset looking for her husband. And she was enlisted the help of her friends, the daughters of Jerusalem, to go out and find him because she couldn't find him. And she gave us that picture of the love of her life last week, the tall, dark, handsome, well-built, muscular guy that we talked about. And uh, we got that description. And we ended with that he was worthy to be found, and but she hadn't found him yet. She's going to find him tonight as we pick up in Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 10, and we'll go through chapter 7. So there's only eight chapters, so you know we're coming very close to the end. And I'm certainly thankful for all those who have followed along, for those who have fulfilled this promise to a former member who wanted me to study, that teach this, and I think we've all been blessed as a result of it. So I will say a prayer for us, and Nancy said she was going to read tonight, and we'll do that after we open with prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege it is that we have to come in your house and open your word and go expositionally through it word by word and to get everything that you want us to hear. We thank you for the technology that takes it into the world and for those who are listening, for those who couldn't be here. We pray that it would touch hearts and souls and that everything we do would bring glory to you. And We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, and Nancy, let's start in verse 10 of chapter 6 where we left off. Okay, Song of Solomon, verse 10. Who is this that grows like the dawn, as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, as awesome as an army with banners? I went down to the wolf of the duck trees to see the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded or the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was aware, my soul sent me over the chariots of my noble people. Come back, come back, O true light, come back, come back, that we may gaze at you. Why should you gaze at the true light, as at the dance of the two companies? How beautiful are your feet and sandals, O Prince Story. The curves of your hips are like jewels, the work of the hands of an artist. Your navel is like a round goblet, which never lacks in its wine. Your belly is like a heap of wheat, dense to bout with oils. Your two breasts are like two fawns. Hands of a gazelle. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. <coughs> your eyes like the pools of Heshbon. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon. I skip by the gate. Your eyes are like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rebbe. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon, which faces towards Damascus. Your head crowns you like pommel, and the flowing rock locks of your head are like purple threads. The king is captivated by your tresses. How beautiful and how delightful you are. My 
grown up with all your charm. Your statue is like a palm tree and your dress are like its clusters. I said, I will climb the palm tree and I will take hold of its cute stalks. Only may your breast be like the clusters of a vine and the fragrance of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. It goes down smoothly for my beloved, flowing gently through the lips of those who fall asleep. I am my beloved's and his desires for me. And that's the word of God for the people of God. May God bless the reading and the exposition of his word. If you didn't know, this is absolutely the most sensual speech or vocabulary in the entire Bible. Even a little bit more sensual than our study of the honeymoon time as they are getting very romantic again as a result of this. As we left, we remembered that Solomon had, you know, had left. They'd had the little skirmish. He had left. She went looking for him. Um, and she had gotten the daughters of Jerusalem to go look for him, and she was out looking for him. And she had an idea where he was at because she knew him well enough that he was in the garden, and in fact he was because we pick up with that in verse 11. And we said that he was still thinking about her, and he had told her that she was better than the 60 queens and concubines that were in the kingdom, and that she was uh, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, and as awesome as an army with banners. She was still thinking about her, but she's going to actually pick up with him, find him in verse 11. Now in verse 11 it picks up, depending on which version, that some think it's a thought, but some of think this is him, saying he, where did he go? He went down to the garden, to the orchard, and was looking at the blossoms of the valley to see whether the vines had budded, he'd gone to check the promegranates. He was there looking at all of the things, because remember he was an outdoorsman, he was a gardener. He was uh, a naturalist. He was where he was, where he loved to be and he left when he left her. He went to the other place that he loved is where his garden was at, dealing with the f fruits and the things of the garden. And he was just caught up in all of that. And which really is what we're going to pick up tonight as we start. But as always we have to have a little humor because of the seriousness of this. Not in a serious way of serious that we're, not like John. First John has been in Sunday school. But this is a little bit, the, the wording and the things we're talking about is not something you usually talk about, love and all that stuff. But if you've ever talked about, talking about the romantic husband, what is, do we have a romantic husband? It's not something that we see a whole lot, but we're going to find in our story tonight, he takes the initiative and begins the romance in this particular story. Anybody ever heard of Bill Hybels? He is a... Uh, probably pastor of one of the largest churches in America, uh, the famous Willow Creek Church in Illinois. Really a model of everything that uh, pastors should stand for and all the things because he had built this small church up into one of the mega churches of today by building, helping a thousand unbelievers find true what new life and a new creation in Christ is. And somebody that really, that people like about him, he's very transparent and you can be honest as a Christian leader because as we've said, one of the fruits of the, I don't say fruits of the Spirit, fruits that we are believers is we don't just say it, John says, we talk, walk the walk. This guy does and he's honest, very self-effacing. Well, he has written a book about marriage with him and his wife and it's called Fit to be Tied, Making Marriage Last a Lifetime. In it, he offers an amusing glimpse into his own efforts to be what the rare specimen in the world is a romantic husband. We know that good old Solomon is going to be that romantic husband tonight as he's going to set the stage for his romantic time with his Shulamite. Well, here's what he said. He was not really the most romantic person, even though that wasn't what he tried. He says, romance was never my strong suit. I proposed to my wife, Lynn, in her parents' garage. Okay. I took my Harley Davidson on our honeymoon. I thought our best anniversary was the one we spent watching a video of Rocky III. Realizing my deficiency, I knew I'd better elevate my game. And I had no clue what to do. Maybe flowers would be a nice start. So I began buying $3 bouquets from the florist who worked out of his car trunk on the street corner opposite of my church. Armed with my beautiful bouquet, I figured I was officially on my way to be a certified romantic husband. Yet my wife seemed unimpressed. Gee, thanks, she would always say. Where'd you get these? And he said, I would always remind her about the guy with the flowers in the trunk 
and I was a high volume buyer. I get a buck off stopping there so often and two bucks off if they're a little bit wielded. I would always grin and we felt very pleased. Well, the flower gifts began to trail off because my wife continued to seem unmoved by my romantic outburst. It seemed odd to me until the truth finally came out at our regular date night. You see, Bill and Lynn occasionally had a session for clearing the air, a time for mentioning the kind of little grievances that would eventually become a problem if not nipped in the bud, what Solomon would call the little foxes. Well, you think ahead of it. There you go. You're on the right page here. On this particular evening, I was at a cheap restaurant, and we were having one of our sessions. Lynn brought out very carefully a prepared list of complaints against me, and I was checking them off with her. Yep, guilty as charged. Oops, yep, right. Ouch. Ooh, yeah. Oh, so true. I need to take care of it. At the end, I was a little dizzy, but I promised I would make a few changes. Lynn says, thank you. Now, how about your list? Well, I didn't really have a list, but I see it seemed fitting to come up with something since she had been so thorough against me. Well, he said, there's one thing. You know, I've stopped the flowers lately, right? Can't say I've noticed, she said. I couldn't believe my ears. Well, there you go. That's the problem. There are untold hordes of husbands that pass that street corner right by those bouquets. Do they stop and get flowers? No. Do it? Do I? Yes. What gives? Why don't you appreciate it? Uh-oh, yeah, sometimes you get what you ask for, guys. Well, the truth is, Bill, I'm not impressed when you give me half-dead flowers from some guy's trunk that happen to be on your way home. The flowers are cheap, and the required effort is almost non-existent. So I put the same amount of effort in my response to you. You're not thinking about what makes me happy. You're thinking about what is most convenient to you. I couldn't believe my ears, he said. So let me get this straight. You'd rather I get up from my desk in the middle of the day, break my study schedule, get into my car, drive into town, and pay quadruple the price just for the hoity-toity flowers in that box. You'd want me to have less sermon time and gym time just so you would have more expensive flowers. Are you telling me that's what would make you happy? Yep, that's what would make me happy. But, but what you're asking for is neither practical economical nor an efficient use of time. That is an excellent definition of romance. Bill, you're learning, she smiled. <laughs> Bill was getting his education well, that sometimes practicality and economical doesn't play when it comes to being romantic and impressing our, as my father used to say, our honeys. Well, we guys just think a little different. We like sports because there's numbers of crunch, stats, home runs, rushing yards, touchdowns, free throws, goals against, all those things, you know. We like all that stuff. Spreadsheets at work, but, you know, sometimes <coughs> romance just has to deal with something that we don't deal a whole lot with, and that's emotions. Well, if we substitute the concept of worship for romance, we have some, a very similar concept. Remember, there was a woman named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet while her sister Martha ran hysterically around the house cooking and cleaning. You all remember that story, right, from John? I think it was, in, yeah, Luke, Luke told us it. And what did Martha complain? Tell her to get here. And Jesus defended Mary, says, because she's doing the, quote, one thing that was appropriate. Once again, observing the same way in the romantic husband, the same way it works with God. Mary was not practical. She was not economical. Nor was she efficient in her use of time because she was sitting there listening to every word Jesus said. But worshiping Jesus was about devotion and emotion, not those other virtues the same way the husband has a relationship. Sometimes it's not practical with the wife. You see the, com the combination? We said, you see how the allegory could come in it. Romantic love and worship is no time for quote-unquote coupon clipping and is measured less by the mind than by the heart. So some things that we do for our loved ones, as I said, don't have to be husband and wife, it can be child, parent, or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's what we do with the heart. It's extravagant. And that's the reason why we've been seeing that Solomon and Shulamite have been dealing with extravagances throughout this book. Uh, the love metaphors, the perfumes, the everything that they shared and the word description of each other. To the rest of the world, it sounds crazy. 
but not to those two. It was the most sensible thing in the world to Solomon and Shulamite. And if you think back when you were dating or courting, as the old timers said, the things that we would look back, we would say, oh, wasn't that corny? Hmm. But it's really their idea. So that's why sometimes we think of these things and we say, well, that sounds kind of weird. Not to these guys. So, given all that background is the idea of Solomon really setting the scene. Uh, sometimes we are like Mary when it comes to dating and Martha in marriage. Sometimes we sit at one another's feet and adore one another, and then sometimes we sit around and do too many things, and when we do too many things, we begin to lose that original first love. Lee, Dr. Robert Stromberg, which was a Yale psychologist, has done some extensive research on love relationships. He has actually attempted to create strategies for making relationships work. He says, once we are married, there is the temptation to relax because it seems we've arrived. We don't have to worry about what we look like. Hey, we've got it. That's why you can be all muscular and buff when you're dating, and about ten, three years later, you look like you, you've got the furniture disease. You know, the, your chest falls in your drawers. You know, where you, Daddy used to say he's monument here. But, you know, you, you let, oh, I've got her now. We don't need it. But we've grabbed our partner, partner, missions accomplished, and certainly we're looking at it from the point of view of me and our, as action and we turn with some relief to something that's a little more practical is building our job or what are we doing. We slowly, usually let the romance leak out of the relationship. And I said we're a little bit like Mary. We get so caught, Martha, we get so caught up in doing we forget that the, the Lord is sitting here. I think the same thing can be said about our relationship. We don't realize... The romantic tool is approaching empty, and the things that we used to do, uh, we let slip. Solomon was not that way. If he had gone away for a little bit, it was time for him to take the lead and become the romantic husband to get the relationship back. Because remember, he's in the proverbial doghouse. Come knock on the door. Too late. You know, it's too late. You've been out late. I don't, we don't know how long, how many times he's been. He may have been out on his job, whatever. But anyway, she was upset, wouldn't have anything to do with it. It's time for him to, to take the lead, and he takes the first step in setting everything that's right. So we rem remember that from chapter 6. Remember that the original writers really don't put into effect the numbers. This was originally just one big letter or song that was sung, and then, of course, mankind, when we said it, Bibles have changed it to chapter 6 and 7. They are not inspired. So... Uh, the last verse of chapter 6 should really be the first verse of chapter 7 in the original Hebrew documents. So the first verse that we see, we finally get to see what her name really is. We've been calling her Shulamite, but he actually comes out and calls her that. And he says, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. We referred to her all along by her derivative of that name, the Shulamite, but here it is. And only here for the matter that she's identified. He finally comes out and calls her by what we know her name is. Now, he begins talking about return, which really can translate, what do you think it would translate? Come back home. Come on back home. Solomon said, come home, so not only can I look upon you, but so we can all look at you. So he's really, he's bought in his friends, and they're all calling for her to come back home. Not in a lustful matter, but because... He misses her. Remember they had a little fight and he's going off back to by himself in the garden and he wants her to come back home and it's a plea for reconciliation. Let's get back together. Let's get back the way it was. We'll deal with it. He longs to see his wife and wants her back the way, she, way it was. Now she replies in the form of a question and initially it's a puzzling question. And Dr. MacArthur said, we don't really know absolutely certain why that little section was in there that I just read about whether he was in the garden or not, whether that's what it was about or not, know for certain. If he says that, hey, maybe we don't know for certain what it is. And this question, there's a puzzling question here that Dr. Jeremiah says. And here's what it says. What would you see in the Shulamite, as it were, the dance of the two camps? Huh? Let me read that again. She's responding because he says, come home, I've missed you. She says, well, what would you see in the Shulamite? as it were, the dance of the two camps. 
Gary Crawford, in his commentary, makes something that we can maybe get some explanation of these odd words. And he says, there was a dance called the Mahanaim, M-A-H-A-N-A-I-M, Mahanaim, I guess. Or it translates the dance of the two camps. Now, Maham was also a place. If anybody knows what it is, I'm going to let you come up and finish. Because I would have never done it. Anybody have any idea what was special about that place? Good. If you did, I'm, somebody's been doing some good research because I'm cheating and I've got the commentary here. Mahanam was a place. It was a place where the angel of host appeared to Jacob in chapter 32 of Genesis. So Solomon thinks of Shulamites as an angel dancing before him. <clears throat> dancing being an expression of spiritual joy anytime you see it in the Old Testament. Now I grew up that, that was one of the nasty nine and the dirty dozen and the dirty five you didn't do. You didn't go to the movies. You didn't go swimming with the ladies. And you certainly didn't go dancing. If you did, guess what? You may have been in the bad place. And you were always worried about you couldn't dance. Remember the movie uh, Footloose? Yeah. We're not going to let you dance. It's hellish. It's, you know, and all this stuff. And, of course, they danced at the end of it. Anyway, Solomon, but dancing was seen as something special and joyous and his expression of spiritual joy in the Old Testament. Remember when David came back from winning the battles and he had his no shirt on and he was dancing and, you know, and the, the wife said, look at you out there dancing. And he says, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. But anyway, they were, they were excited. They had been torn apart. And now he says, he begins to think of her in spiritual and excitement terms of a spiritual joy because she said it was the place that he saw her of the place of dancing. Now, they certainly knew just as when we fight with our loved ones that either we sometimes say things or do things that hurt one another, and now they're both ready for some reconciliation. And, of course, Mr. Crawford in his commentary says, Sot Shulamite was dancing as an expression of joy before her husband and Solomon there in the palace. So we think they've gone back to the palace because, remember, we've shifted around from different places. We've been to their, her mom's place. We've been to the palace. We've been back out in the garden. So it seems we're back into the palace. But the key here is that Shulamarth is coming back home, not because she wants to. We know she does because she was looking for him. But he has set the tone, and she is coming back because he is wooing her and wanting her back. Thus, he's the romantic husband. He's taking the initiative, something that a lot of guys don't like to do. But he's calling out for her, Honey, baby, I want you back home. Elizabeth Rodney Ologene, right? Come on, baby, come on back home. I miss you. So, and she's coming back. She's coming back. And she don't have to be asked twice. And he does it, and he's wanting her to come back is very emphatically because he uses that word four times. Come home, baby. Come on, sweetheart. I mean, I'm sure he probably added some terms, but remember, he has been very good with the words. Love, dove, my perfect one. All those fancy words. Come on, baby. Come on home. So he's calling around, and he does it. And she dances and excitedly comes back for him so she can be with him. And frankly, it may also be, ladies, she may have done it in a seductive way to get his attention. Don't know. Commentary says that could be there. But our premises that were taken from this is that the husband many times should take the lead in some marital relationships. And one of the things... In marital romance, we need to get our mind off of the books and uh, the business, and pay attention to our spouse, and lead the way. So that's exactly what here Solomon is calling his wife home. Come on, and let's get back to the way we were, this loving relationship that we had before I stayed out too late, and you got mad at me and slammed the door on me, right? So anyway, now that's how we close chapter six. We move into chapter seven. Not only has he set the mood, guess what? He knows what words to say. Which shouldn't be a surprise to us because who is he? The king. And what else was he? The wisest man who's ever lived. So ladies, he would know exactly what to say to you to get you to say what, you, what, he, what he needs you to do. So he takes the lead and he does it as he always does with the words of his mouth. <laughs> as we've said all along, Sometimes the romance and the love relationship begins with what we say and then proceeds with what we do. And then we learn a little bit about how a husband can talk the talk before walking the walk with our wives in our relationship. 
The first thing he does is he begins to praise her publicly. He says, return, return, O Shulamite, return that we may look upon you. Now that sounds kind of funny and out of place in that, you know, thinking this is a private one-on-one between him and his spouse. But really he throws that word in there, we. Now the heading tips the reader off. If you use the word, if you're looking at the New King James Version, the heading reads, the beloved and his friends. So they think that it's a group speaking, not just him at the very first time, that just as Shulamith had had her friends, daughters of Jerusalem, out looking for him, now he has his buddies here helping him to go look for her, not in a sexual way, but looking for her to bring her back so they can restore the relationship. So, uh, so friends seem to be a good deal to help him find her, and he's going to do all the things that we need to do. So that one of the things he sets the stage by doing that. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Jeremiah talked a lot about one of the things that a good husband will do is publicly <coughs> praise their wife. However, most of the time, he says it works on the other side, that how many times has he seen a husband really rip down and say negative things to their spouse in front of other people? They might not want to go back home. But I remember sitting at the table one time. I had a couple, had a mixed family. We were doing the last will and testament. And she had already decided what she wanted, and he started doing his. And he included some different things in his will that really excluded some of her family. Okay. I could feel the tension rising. And she said, well, I put your family in my will. How come you're not doing it? He said, let's get one thing straight. I don't think your children deserve a thing I've got. I said, let me tell you what, I'm glad I ain't got to drive home with him. <laughs> and went on with some things. and That was one of those non-places to say that. <laughs> but how many times have you ever seen anybody out and you heard a spouse talk derogatory to another one and beat them down? And Jeremiah was talking about, that's, there's a time and place for that. One of the times you don't air it publicly. But we should do the opposite, is praise our spouse in front of other people because guess what? It will get back to them and it will you know, be better. And of course, one time he said, praise your, if you got a mother-in-law, praise your wife in front of your mother-in-law because your mother-in-law will say it back ten times fold to your daughter, to your wife. But anyway, we praise them publicly so that other people can see how much we love them and how much the relationship is. Well, then he spends the next few verses praising her personally. And he begins by a description of her. So we get another description of her. So it's not here to blush. So uh, if you blushed on the honeymoon night, you're going to blush a little bit here in chapter 7 as he begins to describe just how beautiful she is to him. Whereas in the first time that he described her, he began with her hair. Remember, she had the long curly black hair that looks like goat's hair. And we saw Angie had the picture that night. And sit it out, and I tell you what, it looked like the back of some woman's hair. Those good, beautiful black curly hair. This time he starts on the other end of her. Something that some people don't find attractive, but some people do. It's very sensual out there. And he describes that she has very beautiful feet. And they were not only they were beautiful in the sandals that she wore. And he described her as a noble daughter or daughter of the princess. So we know that she was very, she took care of herself. She was uh, kind of, what's the word I want to see? What is it when you worry about yourself? Uh, self con that is the word. Too many Diet Mountain Dews. I uh, can't remember stuff. Um, he, she's self-conscious. Remember, she was worried about how dark she was, and she wouldn't fit in. But he's building her back up and, and setting the tone, remember, for this romantic time. Everyone, and he begins, you have the most beautiful feet. Now, that's true. There are some people that have beautiful feet, and then there are some that don't. But she does. Sulamite does. And it really is one of the things that's central to him that she takes care of her, and she has beautiful feet. And he describes her here as a, um, a noble daughter or a princess. So he describes her as one of the princes. You know, some husbands call her like honey, sweetie. He calls her his princess, and she's almost like... No, have his nobility about her in the way that she takes care of herself. Well, he begins to move up a little further, and ESV describes it as rounded thighs like jewels. 
I have the impression that she takes very good care of herself because she has long, slender, fit legs. Now, there's guys that like the other end of the body. There's guys that like the other end of it. To me, that's one of the good things if a woman takes care of herself, has nice legs. She takes care of it. Me and Solomon have that in common. Good fit legs and feet are very important to have in Rodneyology and certainly in Solomon's ology. And he likes that about his wife. She has beautiful feet and long legs. And I say, amen to both. But, he, he's, but Dr. Jeremiah brought it up. It's time that husbands really set the fact of one of the things that he's getting ready to say here. She has rounded thighs like jewels, the work of the master's hand. And the commentary says that's one of the things that a husband should really recognize. Society has really poisoned the way that we look at the body. But Solomon says, my wife is beautiful and she is made from the creator. God created his wife and he made her perfect. Beautiful feet and beautiful legs. And he said it's almost like she was masterfully created. Of course, the commentary kept saying, that's one of the things that we should say to our spouses. And of course, the little Rodneyology again here. Daddy used to say, there's a couple things you never ask about a woman, her age and her weight. And he said, I don't care if she's three axe handles across the stern. You always tell her how beautiful she is. <laughs> Solomon is saying she is master. He's shaking his head over here. Mm. Masterfully created. And he is really talking about, hey, she's a creation of God. Regardless of the size, our ladies are handcrafted by the master. And Solomon's picking up, and Dr. Jeremiah said, that's one of the things that we really should take notice of is in our spouses. I guess it works. Well, we know it works the other way because remember last week, she talked about the arms were guns and the chest and the chiseledness and all that good stuff. All that stuff that we, sh that we yearn to go to the gym every day but can never accomplish. Hey, whatever. <laughs> You know, they, they tell you if you take a pill or you take this medicine, you'll, you know, be like this, and your shirt's bulging, like arms swooshing. No, it don't work. It's sweat and running. And I've been trying for years and can't get there, but anyway. But anyway, he's really infatuated with woman's body. Feet is beautiful. Long legs. Now, here's what we were talking about in the car kind of day. Me and Angie Crystal were talking about. He describes her navel. Now, doc, now Dr. Pinkney said, you know, there was a time that you... TV show would not show a woman's navel because it was seen as too sexual and sensual back in the old days. Nowadays they show a lot more, you know. But if you think about it, it was removed. that is another part that really shows that a woman, if she takes care of herself, she's built, she has a, a stomach that has got to be flat if it's the way he's talking about here. But her navel is rounded. And of course, my Angie said, well, I don't know if it's flat if her navel's like a rounded bowl. That's not right. It's a rounded bowl like a god. I think one description describes it as a goblet. Um, but her navel's there. I mean, he, he, he's finding, and you know, we're saying is, we're having to deal with this, but it's in the scripture, but it's one of those things he's just taken delight in every ounce of how beautiful she is. And he tells her that her navel is like a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. He loves her belly. He loves her cute little belly, you know, and, that's one of the things that I'm going to agree with Solomon. He and I are on the same page here at this point. Well, he begins to describe that she has a beautiful navel. And, of course, Dr. Jeremiah said, I think he may be talking about, you know, that he wants to, you know, be involved with her and see her. And he likes her navel and her legs and all that stuff. And then he begins to move up a little bit higher. And he says her belly is like a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. I have not really seen, I listened to several of the commentaries and nobody really described that. Uh, he said it may have been like a wheat field. A wheat field that's at harvest. It's sort of a brown color, you know, the tops of it and it's kind of moving. So <clears throat> maybe as she's standing there and she's breathing, you know, if, you, if you've seen these commercials on TV with you know, women, especially these models and they're, they're, you know, they're breathing, you obviously can see their stomach moving. So maybe he's looking at her stomach and her navel here and it's moving a little bit like uh, the waves of wheat would. But anyway, he's finding the light, she's what we're trying to get across. Huh? Well, that's, that could be true. I mean, as Angie said today, I mean, she's got a baby hole like a goblet. 
She's got to have a little something around it to make it a goblet. One thing that strikes me about this is he's he's describing her in analogies. Yes. Yeah. Every every description is an That's analogy to something else. Yeah. yeah. Well, and uh, don't we do the same today? She's sweeter than honey, prettier than a peach. Imagery. Huh? Imagery. 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 Yeah, because a picture of paints a thousand words. He's singing this. He's writing this to sing, and he's wanting everybody to listen to what his girl looks like. He's already described her hair and her teeth, her white and black hair. She, you got to think, in this entry, the description that he, he's given her, don't, I mean, if you don't know what you're looking at, go, mm-hmm. yeah. teeth. Yeah. He's okay. describing her so that we get a picture of what it looks like. And I tell you, that picture that Angie showed us of those goats coming down the hill literally looked like the back of somebody's head with curly hair coming down. And they were moving, and it looked like curls. And her teeth was white, and she's like um, that singer that used to sing. Her skin's the color of mocha. Uh, so she's got a tan. She's dark color. And as he's standing there, I mean, she's, and she's either got it going on, or as Terry says, she may have a little jiggly there. I don't know. I and mean, he doesn't care. It really excites him because she is fine in his eyes. And he begins to describe her belly and her, her, uh, her, her, belly, her belly button and her belly and all that. Well, we've already heard this particular one again. He described it, and I'm not going to uh, impound it too much, that her two breasts were like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Uh, they must be nice and firm and all that good stuff, so we'll move on about that. And then her neck was like an eye of her. Um, hey, how else can I handle this up here? <laughs> I'm trying to be PG up here, you know? I mean, if this was uh, HBO, you know, you'd... He might blush a little more. Uh, but anyway, she's... I'm not going to say what I was getting ready to say. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jeremiah, said he, his wife told him to handle it with kid gloves as she went through it on there. But her neck is like an ivory tower. She's got a firm neck. Uh, and, and the last time we saw it, she was adorned, remember, with jewelry. He doesn't mention it here, so she must, may have taken that off at this point. Of course, she was getting ready for the wedding at that time, so she was probably still decked out with, the, with that at that point. And then he begins to describe her as pools and hesh by her eyes, uh, by the gates of Bath Ribbon. Uh, once again, as Bill said, this is imagery. Uh, she had described his eyes, remember, as uh, doves in milk, dark and white. Last time, now he describes her eyes as like a pool. Uh, I don't know if that... It means they're blue, like a pool, or it could be a dark color. I, I doubt they were green, because he doesn't. That pool would eat up with algae, I guess. But uh, <laughs> it's either blue. She's either blue eyes or dark hair. So I mean, so anyway, um, and then he begins to talk about her hair, crowns like caramel, and flowing locks like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses. She has long curly hair, and we know last time it was uh, dark curly hair. And he's de- but he's describing her personally so that we have to do that. And certainly we know that she is um, she's just a country girl who had moved into national prominence. Mm-hmm. And really, he's describing her. She's just perfect in his eyes. I mean, that, let's just cut to the case. She's perfect in his eyes. Now, whether she's jiggly, as Terry said a little while ago, or whether she's fit to be tied, uh, regardless to him, he doesn't care. She is the coup de grace. She's, she's it for him. And um, I love what Dr. Jeremiah says. We really need to start seeing our wives as Solomon saw his wife. He says, you know, love has a way of making the one that we love perfect in our eyes. What do we, Daddy used to call it when I was growing up. He'd say, oh, Rodney, you're just looking through rose-colored glasses. Think. Use your head. Because I'd be talking about when I was in high school, this and that. And, he'd, and I'd say, Daddy, so listen. They wouldn't make you do stuff you wouldn't ordinarily do. Think with your head, your eyes. You're looking for rose-colored glasses. All I could think of was there was a movie that um, called Shallow How. Anybody ever seen it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, he looked at her, and she was built like a swimsuit model. And when he, took, when he looked the other way, and everybody looked at her, she was suiting out about 350 and kind of had cankles. And, but he felt ultimately, you know, he loved her. But every time he saw her, he saw one thing, and people were like, eh, what are you doing? And she, she actually sat in a chair one time, and the chair broke, remember? And he said, why'd that happen to you? But anyway, he thinks she is perfect. 
And in a summary statement in verse 6, he really sums it up. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. In all the world, there was no such delight for his spirit, and no one as fair and pleasant as she was. I, have, I should have bought this in tonight, and I actually read it, but it didn't translate as good as I wanted to. It's been a while since we used Eugene Peterson's message. That is, one of, if you ever want to learn something, get it out. It really puts it in everyday language. Here's how we translate this. Your beauty within and without is absolute. Powerful and personal praise. He is, she is everything for him. Well, uh, warning. The couple is not finished praising each other in their bodies yet. It's clear they like what they see when they look at each other. And they seem to never be tired of talking about one another in this situation, except when they had the little, um, little get to get little flare up there. And I, it's we can now we can assume, even though the old saying about what assuming does, that they are now in the privacy of their own home. They're not out on the streets. They're back in. If they're in the temp, uh, Jerusalem, they're there. Wherever they may be, they're alone. It's just the two of them there. And then. Um, Solomon has given us this very sensuous description of his wife. This is the third time that he's described her body. Over in chapter 4 he had done it, and then in uh, chapter 6 he had talked about it, and he did it in very specific terms, um, starting from the head to the feet and then from the feet to the head. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah said, as I, used to, as I was preaching this, he said, I got some not-again looks from my audience, the way y'all kind of looked at me a while ago as I was going through it. It seems a little bit of uncomfortable and squirming as we talked about it. But I couldn't help but read this here that C.S. Lewis did. Oh, was his favorite guy. He would be proud that I put this here. From his book called Mere Christianity, which really explains the essence of our faith and the logic behind it. At the time he wrote it, C.S. was just a bachelor, but he had some perception about Christian sexuality, which is what we're talking about. He says, quote, Christianity is almost the only one of the great religions which thoroughly approves of the body. God himself did what once he took on a human body. And some kind of body is going to be given to us in heaven. We're going to have a new body. Remember Paul says the old body is going to be replaced by a new, new one. Christianity has glorified marriage more than any other religion. And nearly all the greatest love poetry in the world has been produced by Christians. So if anyone says that sex in itself is bad, Christianity contradicts that person at once, end quote. So society has really made us, when we talk about this, to squirm and think bad because we think about it from the point of view of the outside world. Oh, it's, it's this and that, and you know, we compare ourselves with this and that, and it's a negative, and the church has come in because they've let it pit poison. But C.S. Lewis says, no, really, God created the body and made it, who it was, and we should appreciate it. But we've let society dictate, like everything else to us, the negativity of it. I'm going to read all what he says. Quote, if you think there's something ugly about the human body or sexuality, you didn't hear it from God. Over the centuries, we've seen cultural influences that brought that perspective into the church and into society, which was the overreaction against public immorality. In fact, the human body is beautiful, and it was made by no one but God himself which does not make anything ugly or make anything dirty. We are so shocked by Solomon, but he's the one who's right. Perhaps he would be shocked by the modern church's dealings with sexuality if he was to see it today in the past the way we look at it. I never thought about it, but as Oz would say, you've got to read some C.S. Lewis, he makes you think. Mm -hmm. But isn't that uh, exactly what Solomon is doing? He, he was reviewing her feet, her thighs and her navel and her waist and her breast and her neck, her eyes, her nose, her head and her hair. From foot to hair, from toe to head, Shulamite is getting Solomon's seal of excellence and approval. He is satisfied with the one he got. And isn't that what a wife needs to hear today from her husband in sight of everything because we stand in line at Walmart and all the magazines and all the TV. They're all about what this big around and they're picture perfect. We don't know how many times they photoshop them. They don't have a wrinkle on their face. Uh, they've got their picture perfect. They're 
double D's and 32 and a little 28 inch waist with double D's up top and nice thighs and they are perfect. And we know there's no, nobody perfect in the world. And Solomon is described, baby, you are perfect in my eyes. And he is see, he's setting the scene. And she needed to know that she would be appealing. And she would be appealing then. She'd be appealing five years later, 15 years later, 25 years later, and all of that. She needs to know today exactly what needs to be done. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah tells the story here. You've got to have these stories in there to keep this going here. <laughs> he says, uh, One minister clearly kept the fires of his marital love burning well over the years that they had been married. He said, Anytime he would go off to a pastor's retreat, he would tell a couple of friends of his, I can't wait to get to see my wife this weekend. When I get home, the second thing I'm going to do is put down my suitcase. It was surprising and amusing. But he wasn't being rude. He was actually being godly and enjoying the wife and praising her publicly and admittingly loving and desiring his wife and her body that he had given. I love that saying. The second thing I'm going to do when I get home is put my suitcase down. The first thing is, baby, here I come. And so husbands need to make sure that we tell our wives that we appreciate them and that and all that is there. We shouldn't be embarrassed about doing it and all that. And we certainly should do it physically, praise her physically and certainly publicly. And the last thing he says, begins to talk about is this picturesque way here um, is he, as he's described her visually and all of that that he, that he really wants to do. And, he, and uh, really, um, he goes into a lot more talk about it here, but um, I was on it just a little bit, or Bill was on it a little bit while ago, talking about metaphors, using something to describe. Life, like we say, life is a rat race or a simile, like life is like a baseball game. But he was using the only way that he could describe his relationship with his wife mm -hmm. and the things he wanted. The curves of your thighs are like jewels. And he described it to her. Certainly it was beautiful <coughs> in everything that we did. Certainly not literal, but certainly in his culture, his day, people who listened would have certainly understood everything. And if they didn't understand it, I guarantee you she would have knew what he was talking about. She loved it. Well, let's see here. We pick up the last part of our section here is in verse 6. Is we actually get to see, to enjoy the relationship. Finally, we need to learn to enjoy the results of the romantic love that they had here. As Ed and Gail Wheat described in one of their classic books about Christian relationships, our wives want to hear the right words, but they also want to experience the right behavior that shows that goes along with it. We want to say the right thing, we want to do it. We don't want to say this and that, and then, hey, get her all excited, you're sitting there in a chair, you know, like that. You've got to do it. Now, Solomon's words don't stop at conveying his wife's beauty. They demonstrate not only how beautiful she is, but that she's also desirable. And he shows that, that in his words. And he says, how pleasant and fair you are. There's that terminology. This guy knows how to speak. The stature of, your, your stature of yours is like a palm tree. And your breasts are like clusters, he said. I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. Let now your branches be like clusters of the vine. The fragrance of your breath like apples. And the roof of your mouth like the best wine. I ain't going there. You can think for yourself what he's talking about. You know what Dr. Jeremiah says? Don't expect for me to give you a precise explanation of those verses. He desires her and certainly uh, everything is, he's passionate about what his love for her. She's been silent. She's been listening to everything. And now it's time in verse 9, the last two verses that we will see tonight, it's time for her to respond and speak. And as always, a good woman always has the last word. Right? She says, the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. I am my beloved's, and his desire is towards me. That's like the second time or third time that she's said that. This couple really um, has, has the idea that they're married and that they belong to one another. Matter of fact, it's, he calls it the third of a trilogy of statements that kind of creates a three-part idea of the relationship. The first one was back in chapter 2 
where it says, I believe she says, my beloved is mine and I am his. In chapter 6, it's I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And now it's 10, I am my beloved's and his desires towards me. She has no doubt that she's, they're, they're meant for one another. So we can put those together in some time of symmetrically. And the first time she was emphasizing her ownership of him, and then he ownership her. And this time, it's a little deeper as they are both fundamentally one, and they come, they're, they're together here. And so this is part of the relationship that the two of them have, and certainly uh, it's something to be to be praised upon. Well, as we close out. And we said this whole book really is not, I mean, you can really take it as the love relationship, which is the way we have it, also something we've taken as an allegory. And Ed Young Jr. in his commentary talks about the meaning of marriage. He says, there are many purposes for which God has instituted the idea of marriage. One is the ultimate expression of companionship for which he wired us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It was not good for man to be alone. He needed a helper, and he created woman from the, from the rib. <coughs> it's also seen that marriage is the, uh, the foundation of human society. Third reason, certainly, is to procreate and fulfill the earth, remember to go forth and multiply and all that. And certainly, it's also to be made enjoyable and delight in one in your marriage. But yet, that's not the end of the matter. He goes on to suggest that there may be a more profound spiritual meaning to marriage even than any of those things about you know, procreation and filling the world and all the stuff that we've been talking about. And this is where we get to allegory this whole book. The sacrament of marriage represents the bond between Christ and the church. We are set apart for something greater than ourselves in marriage even as we are in our church's identity as believers. We're all believers in one church. In marriage, remember, the union is greater than the sum of its parts. The two unity candles that, that come together, they snuff out, they become one. The church, which we know is the, becomes the body of Christ, is similarly a group of individuals who now become the presence in, the, in this world of the Lord himself. Let me go back and say that again. It's, Good, heavy stuff here, but it makes a lot of sense. Just as two people leave their single life and become one, the same way as the church is a group of individuals who come together and who become the presence of the Lord into the world. Because Jesus is not physically walking around the world today. But the church is a representation of Jesus into the world. We hope it's supposed to be, if it's work done right. So in both marriage and and ministry, quote, God uses the relationship of giving and taking, sharing and caring, sickness and health to help set us, us, sanctify us to himself to make us pure and make us holy. So the church is like the husband and wife that come together. The church is people coming together to take the word out to show who God is. That's the allegory that we've been coming through this, this whole idea. In other words, quote, put it in layman's terms, by the very nature of being married, we should find ourselves becoming transformed to the image of Christ. Together we walk in the Spirit. Together we walk in the will of God. Every step of the way we help each other, heal one another, encourage one another toward the ultimate goal to be more like Christ. Just as a marriage comes together and we try to build each other up the way Solomon and Shulamite of the church, who is the bride of Christ, should be coming together, encouraging one another. When Terry feels down, hey, What's going on, Aunt Seen? Are you doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing i just a little down here. I need a little pick-me-up here to encourage and to build up and do the things that we should. And that's the whole idea of this allegory of the church and the marriage of Christ is we are to take that out into the world and do the things who makes Christ more visible to the world when the church goes out and acts like it should. However, it works the opposite when we're bickering and fighting. And we can't say, well, I don't like Nancy playing the piano. And she, I go out and say that, and then, of course, I remember growing up that there was always some kind of argument at the church, and I remember Daddy one time saying, if that's religion, I got all I want of it. It's setting a bad example. How many people have always heard that? Instead of being unified, in, an example of Christ out in the world the way a marriage cup is, we come out and bicker and complain about it. Church shouldn't be that way. One of the other things he does is he says, you know, 
we, we build each other up. And Dr. Jeremiah says, and I can see my wife telling me this. He says, I was on the way out the door to preach one morning when my wife said to me, Honey, your left pants cuff is curled down. Barbara would say that, would he? Yeah, you're caught up over here. He said, I started to fix my cuff. She said, well, you got some weight on the bottom of your pants. She, he said, I had been oblivious to those imperfections. Needless to say, my mind was sermon bound. Do you think she was finding fault with me? No. She was pointing out these things because she loves me, and she takes pride in me looking my best at church and wants every single listener to hear my word rather than to be looking at my wardrobe malfunctions. Because well, you know they would. Got a, well, he's got a stain up there, a stain on his tie. Or how many times have we seen one of the preachers up there and his tie stuck over here hanging crooked and all that? <laughs> there are times, he says, when she points these out and she does it because she has my back. I'm a better man every single day because I'm married to her and she does that. And he says that's the way it is with a church. The point is that everyone should have a marriage that makes both members a little more like Christ. And the congregation should do the same, build each other up so that we're all a little more like Christ, so that we, and as Ed Young concluded, says marriage, I believe, is not so much for our happiness as it is for our holiness. There are something deep. Say it one more time. Marriage, I believe, is not so much for our happiness as it is for our holiness. What? One man. One man, one woman forever. Amen. Happiness, he said, is certainly, a, and then of course a bright product would be a effect of being. So you see, finally, we finally got to that point where we have finally got into the allegory of the marriage relationship. Next week, as we come down to the next to the last lesson, we're going on a little getaway. Just as it's always good to get away from everything. Jennifer's shaking her head back there. It's called the Great Escape. They're going to get away for a little rendezvous away. They're going to go maybe for a little uh, trip to uh, a cruise, a little trip to Niagara Falls, wherever maybe. We're going to take a little trip, and then we'll come back on the last lesson and talk about how Solomon says how we can stay in love for life. Anybody got anything to add to it? A little sensual. Dr. Jeremiah said it's the most sensuality in all the Bible. So if you made it through this lesson and didn't blush and squirm, hey, there's nothing else in the Bible that'll make you blush. I couldn't help but think when you talk about how the, you know, Christ, God created the sexuality. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that was part of the religion and yep. how they encountered the, encounter the wonderful sexuality with the awful, which the world is doing today mm -hmm. instead of, and then when we fall yep. heir to that because we yep. look at stuff we shouldn't look at or hear things we shouldn't, we become just like the world and we should read Solomon, the Song of Solomon, and stay in it. This is the good sexual part. Well, he had said earlier, and it's sort of what you had said a few minutes ago, Now I was talking about that, I'll just get ready to allude to a little bit about there. He said, if God created it, what did he say? Every time he created something in Genesis, he created it and it was good. And we're the ones who screwed it up. So if he created it and he said it was good, it's got to be good in of itself. Like I said, we ruin everything. But certainly, and in one of the lessons that for Revelation buffs, go back here the videos, what did we say? The devil never done anything original. He copies everything. Exactly. Remember the whole, we got the Trinity in the, uh, today, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Amen. Remember the, the devil. devil set up the unholy Trinity, which was the devil, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And he does the same thing here. He's, he never made it to be a casual thing. No. 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 He created it to be perfect and good, and we've let it <coughs> get to that.
true. Anything? I, I, I told you when we started the study, you would find yourself somewhere in it. Anybody not found themselves somewhere in it? Being there, heard something, done something. Say, hey, yeah, that's the way it was. Or I remember saying that. But anyway, two more lessons, and then we'll be moving into the introduction to the book of Acts. We'll have a really, as Hetty's not here, Luke part two. <laughs> Uh, but coming up in a couple of weeks. But anyway, I, I really enjoyed it, and thank you for letting me teach on it. As I said, next week, the great escape, and then we will wind it up the week after that. Anybody have anything else to say or add to it that come to mind? Think about our enemy. Uh, poison the water, pervert everything that's good and true. Yep. Part of his counterfeit, and certainly the very opposite of our best interest, mm -hmm. the Lord's best. Well, the original church in its purity was supposed to be that way. And then slowly but surely, notice it was not from outside the church it was destroyed. It was always in from the inside out. Heresy, lies, falsity comes in and destroys it from the inside, not from the outside. Just the same way as in a marriage. Most of the time it's not the outside, it's from the inside. How, Nancy, you were right about it. How profound is that statement? that we did at the very beginning when she says, beware of the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. I mean, how many times does that keep coming up and we just kind of blew past it and we are like... The first thing the marriage counselor should say is, okay, tell me about your little foxes. Because it's not the big things. Not putting, screwing the toothpaste lid on, leaving the toilet seat up, uh, not putting the milk, putting the milk back, back without the lid on it or... Some people are shaking. You know, Bill said, I've seen those things, you know. The things that we do that irritate are the little foxes. And I remember we kind of just blew past it the first time, and I keep thinking, wow, she was on to something because she knew that the little foxes would keep coming back and causing trouble. Because the big things really usually drive people together. It's the little things that aggravate us. Oh, yeah. She burnt the chicken. She got bad perfume. He leaves the toilet lid up. He don't take the trash. The toilet paper's all backwards. I used to work for a lady when I was before I started practicing myself, and some so that was some of the things that we would do when we were clerks and carriers and all that. And she'd come in, she says, "You put that toilet the toilet paper on upside down." Yes. <laughs> so. yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what Granny said? Gra Granny said, when you're by yourself, you ain't got nobody else to blame. There you go. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the privilege it is to gather and Lord to. As, uh, as Pastor Paul used to say, it's always good to have humor in the church. I mean, growing up, we always learned that church was not a place to have fun and carry on, but certainly it's a time of fellowship to come together and hear your word. And certainly the lessons we've learned today is to, as we keep saying over, beware of the little foxes that come in and destroy, because the devil would do, love to do nothing else but let loose a few foxes into not only our marriage relationships, but our friend relationships and our church relationships to destroy us from the inside out. That's why that night in the upper room when you prayed for us, you prayed that we'd be unified in one. And certainly that is the way this allegory of this lesson is, is the marriage couple comes together, we should come together as one and have a united force as we go out in the light of the word and be salt and light to those in the darkness out in the world. We thank you for this word. We thank you for the lessons, what we've learned from it. The privilege it is to gather together. And for everyone who's here, I once again pray for a blessing upon those. We lift up every church, every pastor, every musician who represents that church here tonight that they would continue to stand firm in the truth in a dark world, to go forth and show others the power of truth, the power of love, the power of just fellowship, that you didn't call us for hatred and division. You called us to come together in love and be one to go into the world. We thank you for that. We pray for our nation. We pray for our world, for those in war-torn countries, protection for the church, but also for the citizens through there, especially in the Ukrainian area. 
We pray for the division in our country, those who've lost loved ones due to shooting and hatred and violence. We pray that the church would stand firm and be a guiding light. We pray for people like Franklin Graham and the Samaritan's Purses out in these countries being hope and sending chaplains out. May they continue to do that. And we just thank you for all the things that you bless us with in our country. As we find lots of faults with it, but the last time I looked, people were dying to get in, not to leave. We thank you for the privilege it is to be here. We thank you for being in your house. Thank you and ask for your hand of protection from the military that keeps us so we can come in. And Lord, we ask all of these things in your name, knowing that you've always loved us. You always have and you always will. Amen. Amen. Amen.